Okay, as I've got up here, several of you have asked, K-State Online gives your score that's posted so far out of 100. It's just not very smart about the idea that part of the test is multiple choice and part of it isn't. What's posted right now on K-State Online is what came out of the machine, does not include anything that you might have written in as your own answers, and is based on a maximum of 64, not 100, okay? I am hoping that by late tomorrow, you'll have everything on there and you'll see what your grade is. Uh, when, and I'm still hoping the test will come back on Friday. On the test, the only score that we written on there are the things that we've actually graded. So look up your score on K-State Online so you can add the two together, okay? Okay, one other uh, quick announcement, and that is that I know for some of you, uh, parent-teacher conferences get in the way of uh, going to school because your kids uh, don't have school that day. If you want to bring your kids to class, as long as they're well-behaved, uh, I don't mind. Uh, they can come in. They can ask questions, too. Sometimes they ask really good questions. Uh, sometimes I have them help me up here. Uh, occasionally, you might have to take them out. I once had a, uh, a mother bring two three-year-old twins, and that didn't work very well. Uh, but she sat in the back and she left when it wasn't working, so that's okay. Okay. Now, I had a student who wanted to make an announcement. She's disappeared. Okay, well, we'll see if she can fit in here for a second. Okay, well, you've looked at, well, at first, any other questions? And questions specifically about the test we'll take when you get, back, get it back, but any other general questions? Okay, what we want to talk about today uh, to follow up on the exploration activity that you just finished is what happens when no force is acting on an object. Now, in some ways that seems totally obvious, right? You have force equals zero. You know that force equals mass times acceleration. And therefore, force equals zero, the acceleration should equal zero. Well, that makes sense. But it turns out that, as we'll see, and as you've probably already seen, that sometimes leads to some confusion and some uh, misconceptions overall. And now she wants to make an announcement. Okay. <laughs> program working with underprivileged children and families in places like Thailand and the Dominican Republic or Costa Rica. Or you can volunteer work in conservation, working in environmental areas such as endangered species major and rainforest regeneration in countries such as Australia, New Zealand, Ecuador. Do the second two weeks you'll travel extensively throughout your host country, meet local people amongst very various ecosystems. You will also participate in exciting adventure activities such as white water rafting in Costa Rica, glacier climbing in New Zealand, scuba diving in the Great Barrier Reef, and elephant safaris in Thailand. Now, guys, there is a cost involved. However, the entire cost can be secured by tax deductible sponsorship donations from the community. So, if this sounds exciting to you, I'm going to pass around this sheet of paper and ask you to please print your name and your email address clearly so I can send you an email with more information. Then rip the flyer off the back, which will tell you about our website. It will also tell you about information we're having this Thursday at the Union on the hour every hour, 9 to 12, 12, 1 to 3, 4. And 5, we create other students from this university to participate last year. I'll collect a sheet of paper at the conclusion of class up front on this table. Oh, eggs. Be careful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming you've read a lot, which you can give all your 
ourselves this summer. I look forward to seeing you all at the information meeting on Thursday. Thank you very much. For You're your welcome. Time. And I'll see you guys on Thursday. Okay. And, and there's a good chance you won't get eaten by a crocodile. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, okay, we need to get moving here. Okay. Okay, so let's go on with a little bit more. What I'm going to do is start out with a couple more examples that are similar to what you did upstairs. Uh, and again, we want to talk about forces being zero, at least on some objects. And the couple I'm going to do are similar to what you did where you had maybe had a force on one object, but it didn't apply to another one. Okay, and the first one are my eggs here. I better do this before somebody else knocks them over. Okay, and the idea here is similar to what you did upstairs where you had to get the penny into the cup, uh, what was sitting on top of the uh, card, and you had to do that in some way. Now, I'm going to do the same thing, except I'm going to be a little more adventuresome here, and I'm going to do it with some eggs. Okay, so I've got three eggs sitting up here. And I've got three mugs down there. And what I want to do is get the eggs into the mugs without touching them. And they've given me this broom to do it. Okay, so how am I going to do it? Yeah, Terry. Uh, you're going to step on the broom, uh, and snap. Oh, he's seen this before. <laughs> ah, he says I'm going to, okay, I've got to get him out from underneath there. That, and he's right, by the way. That means I have to apply a force to the tray, but not apply it to the cup, or not apply it to the eggs, right? Now, what would happen if I just took my broom, used it like a baseball bat, and went like that? Yeah, let's don't try that, right? Particularly the people in the front row wouldn't like that. Uh, because some force would be transferred to the eggs. Okay, so we'll do it this way, as recommended. We'll see how good I am. Two out of three, not bad. Okay. What happened to that guy? He cracked, okay. Okay, so let's look at what happened here. Um, and again, it's exactly like what happened you guys did upstairs. Uh, got the tray. I've got, I'll just do one egg. And I've got this down here. Okay. So now I apply a force to the tray. Okay. That force is not applied to the eggs. The force accelerates the tray out from under the eggs, and therefore it goes off in that direction. But because the force was not applied to the eggs, the, for the eggs are not accelerated in that same direction. Okay. Net result is they sit there, or they don't sit there because gravity acts on them and they get pulled down. Okay? What's the value of these little aspirin bottles? Let's see if somebody else besides Terry wants to answer. Yeah, no. Counteract the trigger of Okay. Got this on here. If I had, where's my leftover egg? My egg's sitting right there. It could roll with the tray because of friction. Also, we have a lip on the tray, right? And so if it got to the edge, it would now apply a force and knock it off. By putting it up here as it comes along, the force is applied to the pill bottle and not to uh, the egg. And so the egg drops down. OK, one more. What's the purpose of the water? This is from last week. You, I could have asked you this one on the test. 
So I've got water in here. The eggs drop into water. Yeah, they don't break, right. But why don't they break in terms of forces? What, what are we increasing in that case? Right, we're increasing the interaction time. So we have a long interaction time. <coughs> so we have a small force. So the eggs sink down into the water. And as they float back up eventually, but as they go down into the water, there's a small force acting on them. And the net result is they don't break. That did not work for the one that somehow hit the table. It now has several cracks in it because short interaction time, it has a big force. Okay, that's one. Okay, here's one you can try at home. It makes great conversation over Thanksgiving dinner uh, when it gets kind of dull or your parents start asking you about what you're doing in Aggieville on Saturday night. You can change the subject rather quickly. And this one is also related to things that we did upstairs. Okay, so I've got my place setting here. Put a toothpick in my cup, but that's okay. Ew, no, not very good wine, but uh, what, it's okay. Okay, now I'm going to try to get the tablecloth out from under the uh, dishes. And of course, what I can do is the way one does that is one just pulls along, right? Except that doesn't work very well because the dishes are coming along with it. However, if I do that, it works much better. Okay, now why did that work in terms of the forces? Where did I apply the force? Okay, I applied the force to the paper, not to the dishes. Now, if I apply it slowly, it's very much like what you did with the, the little dial on the cart and you pull the string. You apply it slowly, friction has time to interact, the whole thing comes off. Apply it quickly, then those things stay where they were because the force is not being applied to them but the force is being applied to our tablecloth here. We, we can't afford very expensive tablecloths. Okay. Okay. Okay, is that clear? What's going on there? It's all very much similar to what you did upstairs. Okay, now for this one, there, there is a little trick I should mention to you in case you do want to try this at home. Uh, you need to be sure that you come out straight, right? If I had pulled like that, what would have happened? Yeah, all this stuff would go over and the wine wouldn't have been much of a loss, but something else might have been, and I could have started a fire. Okay, I would, because in that case, I'm pulling up, what do I do? I apply a force up on the dishes. So the way to make sure that you're coming out straight is actually to pull down, because then you use the the table itself as a guide to make sure you're pulling, pulling it out straight. Uh, and we actually have this set up upstairs uh, just so you can try it, at, but we are giving you plastic dishes instead of real ones. Uh, but you can give it a try upstairs and see how it works. Uh, the other warning is if you do it at Thanksgiving dinner, make sure that you don't have your great grandmother's lace uh, tablecloth with all the little bumps on it, right? What happens when the bumps go by? They apply a force because they're sticking up a little bit further. And then the conversation changes in a way you'd rather not have it change. Okay. Okay. So, all that's, where did I put it? There we go. All that's clear so far, I hope, or maybe I should check. Any problems? Okay, let me put some structure to this. These are all examples of what is called Newton's first law.
And in some ways, what Newton's first law says is if there's no net, no net force, there is no change. And let me emphasize that word, no change in motion. Okay, so that means no change in the momentum, no change in the velocity if there is no net force on the object. Okay, and the, the really critical word here is change. Much, much uh, importance on that word. Okay, and now to see how we're doing, let's do the first PDA question which talks, you, talks to you, asks you about the video of the astronaut, actually it's the last video of the astronaut. Remember, he was moving through uh, Skylab. The, the first two were, were sort of still, but they were moving around like this, uh, doing calisthenics and so forth. One thing that that points out is that the net force must be external to the object. While they could twist and turn, they weren't moving horizontally or vertically. Now the third one was moving through and he was twisting and turning at the same time. So what I want you to look at right now is to ask about what was the direction of the net force, net external force that was acting on him while he was uh, going through, the, through uh, the space station. So go ahead and answer that question. And I just remembered I forgot to log on to see what your answers are going to look like. Let me get you a different one. Okay, try again. about this a little bit. Uh, get this on. Uh, we have kind of an equal distribution of results here. Some say in the direction he was moving. Some say in the opposite direction. Some say no net force. And this is what I meant about this gets a little bit tricky sometimes. And that's why we need to talk about it. Okay, now, if he's moving along and 
He's in space, so he doesn't have to deal with gravity. Uh, he's in a, actually a rather low, he's got some air there, but that's just about it. Uh, obviously has some air he's breathing. But uh, other than that, not much going on. And he's moving along, and his velocity does not change. Now let me back that up just a little bit. Ah, too far. More trouble than it's worth. There we go. Okay, so as he's moving along, his velocity is not changing. What's happening with the force that's acting on him? Okay, she says there can't be a force. Okay. Is it equal to it? Okay. What do you mean by equal to it, Michelle? <laughs> Not quite sure, huh? Yeah. Okay. You got yeah. Yeah, you yeah, you got the right idea. You got the right idea. Words are a little different. This this statement I have up here at the top works the other way too. Okay. If there's no net force, there's no change in motion. If there's no change in motion, then what we have to conclude is that there's no external force acting on him. Okay. He's moving, but he keeps moving because, uh, because he's been moving before. Now at some point in the past, there had to be a force acting on him, right? Because he couldn't get moving if he didn't have a force, because that changes him from not moving to moving. But for that period of time that we watched the video, he was not moving. Or, I'm sorry, he was moving, but he did not have a force acting on him. Okay. Now the reason that's confusing is because that never happens on Earth in, norm in normal uh, type situations. If I get my box of chalk here moving, it eventually comes to a stop. Okay? Even if I, well, I shouldn't throw it. Let me throw this instead. Uh, if I throw something, it eventually comes to a stop. Okay? So when, we're, when our everyday life situations, if there's not a force acting on it, eventually things stop moving. But that's because really of two things. That's friction and gravity. That's an A there, I think. <laughs> I just made it worse. Oh, let's not. You, you know how to spell gravity. You don't need me. Right. Uh, okay, so those are always with us. But Newton's first law is made for the completely general situation where uh, there's no net force so that things keep moving. And they keep moving, and if they're already moving, they keep moving in a straight line just like they were. Remember, change in motion means change in direction too. So net, no net force on something that's moving means that it just keeps going and it, uh, it doesn't change either its direction or its, or its speed. It does not change its velocity. And so again, we need to focus on the word speed, on the word change. Okay. Okay, and this is this is a point that that trips us all up from time to time. So I will. So we need to emphasize it quite a bit. Any questions? Any other questions? Okay, let's look at this from a slightly different way because the concept is actually even older than Newton. 
Uh, and also, in addition to that, uh, there's some words here that are not uncommon uh, in everyday life. And the word that comes up a lot is one called inertia. And the concept of inertia is really a very old one. It started in the Middle East uh, while Europe was in the Dark Ages. Most of the good science that was going on in the world was going on in the area of the world that's now in total turmoil uh, because those were people who were thinking about these things. And so in the Middle East, this idea of inertia developed uh, between about 1400 and 1600 or so. It was not quite complete, and so Galileo in uh, Italy put it together and made a, uh, made a, actually invented the word inertia, I believe, and then put the idea into a, a more formal situation or more formal form. Uh, and inertia is just the tendency of an object to keep doing whatever it was doing. Okay, so for our purposes, since we're talking about mo motion, it's the tendency to stay in motion if an object is moving or to not change its motion. If it's not moving, then it means it just keeps sitting still. Okay. Now, it, another way to say it is the inertia is the resistance to change. And that's the way it's used in everyday life. So if people talk about uh, the government having a big inertia, that means they, you know, they think it's very hard to change the government. And, or if you think your physics professor has a big inertia, uh, maybe it's because he's got a lot of mass, uh, but maybe it's also because he's just hard to change. He keeps doing things the way he's always done them and so forth. In our world, it's going to relate specifically to motion, the ch tendency to stay in motion if it's already moving, or the tendency to stay still if it's not moving. Okay. Now, one demonstration here that is used, that we can use with inertia, is something not very complex, but it's a heavy weight, heavy mass, probably a couple kilograms. I think it's, this is a little sphere filled with lead. And what I'm going to do is I've got two strings attached to it. Whoops, need it the other way. And I am going to break one of the strings, obviously. <laughs> OK, I wasn't supposed to break it yet, though. Uh, Okay, we'll try this again. I'm going to pull on the end of the bottom string in a very clever way so that I don't break my finger. Uh, and the question is that I want you to think about and answer is which of the two strings will break first? Will it be the top string or the bottom string? And what I, I'll even show you how I'm going to do this. I'm going to stick this Army surplus broom, broom handle, I guess. At least, at least it's paint, painted like it's army. And it looks like an old broom ham, handle. And I'm going to pull down eventually. And the question is, will this string break first or will that string break first? And think about this in terms of the inertia of this object and also in terms of what you did upstairs uh, regarding the time of the application of the force. And with that, go on to the next question on the PDA and answer it, and then we'll do the experiment. But I want you to predict it first.
636. Okay. Looks like this top string is won by a sizable margin. So let's do it. Ready? OK, now why did the bottom string break first? OK, what about in terms of, stop, think about it in terms of the inertia. Okay, Terry, yeah. Yeah, so, the, so we can think about it in terms of the inertia because the ball tends to stay in the same spot that it was. Therefore, when I apply a force, the string broke. Yeah, Melanie? Would it have been different if we applied the force like slowly instead of all at one time? She's good. Ah. <laughs> this is a trick question. OK, how can I get the top string to break first? Apply the force slowly. Now there's a force that I'm applying, but since I don't do the sudden snap, the force of gravity pulling down on this thing adds to the force that I'm already applying, and that puts an even greater force on the top one than is on the, uh, the bottom one, and so the uh, top one tends to break first, and in fact, the bottom one has not broken yet in that case. Okay, so it was a trick question, right? <coughs> Whatever you'd answered, I would have done the opposite. So, uh, <laughs> so it's the only time I get to do that all semester, so I, I have to take advantage of it. But the point here is to think about the forces acting. Okay, I've got this big ball here, I've got a string, I've got another string, I pull with a sudden force down here. There's still a force on the top one, but this ball tends to stay in the position that it's in, in part because it has a very heavy mass. Okay. As a result, this force gets to be big enough as I pull slowly to break this string. Okay, so that's the bottom one. The other case, I'm pulling slowly on the bottom one, smaller force. But that force adds to the force that the ball is applying to the top one. And it takes a little longer, but the top string breaks because there's a bigger force on it. Okay. So it can go either way, but in all of that, we're taking advantage of the inertia of the ball. Now, this is very closely related to what you did with the uh, doll upstairs that was connected to the computer and the force time diagram, okay? When you pull slowly, then your forces are adding together. The doll comes along because there's a little bit of friction between the doll and the cart, okay? When you're pulling rapidly, then you, that friction doesn't have time to act, the doll flop flips off the back, okay? And you get a different type of curve, okay? So, to see how we're doing with that, uh, the next question on the PDA wants you to take what you remember, and I hope you all do, uh, about the force time diagrams that you saw in the uh, computer activity upstairs and apply them to this situation and in particular, what does, which of the three things I have on the screen, and, oh, I've forgotten which order I put them in, but I think it's, there's one like this, there's one like this, and there's one like that, where, which one is most closely related to the top string breaking, okay? So go ahead and answer that one.
Okay, did well. Did well there. Okay, let me switch back. Whoops, let me switch that way. Okay, top string breaking was a smaller force over a longer time. Okay, smaller force over a longer time is this one. Okay, now a few people answered A, so any questions about that before we go on? Okay, the important point is here that when I did it with the bottom string breaking, it was a very short force, very, I'm sorry, very large force over a very short time. With the bottom one, it was a longer force over a longer time. And that corresponds to the situation where the dowel stays on the cart a little bit longer. Okay. Okay, good, we're doing well. Okay, now one nice thing, I guess nice thing, about Newton's first law, actually about any of Newton's laws, uh, but that we will use a lot uh, in the next couple of weeks, is that you can, apply, you can apply Newton's first law to forces when you break them up into different parts or different components. So what I can do is I can do this for any two components which are at 90 degrees to each other. And uh, if, you know, if you were in engineering physics, we'd do something silly like putting them at 90 degrees like that or so forth. But here we'll just, that's because engineers don't have anything better to do with their time. Okay. They don't, yeah, they're supposed to stay home and work and not, not do anything else. We will do it for horizontal forces and vertical forces. And so, what Newton's first law tells us in this case is if there is no force on an object in the horizontal mo direction, there will be no change in its horizontal motion. Okay. If there's no force in its vertical direction, there'll be no change in its motion in the vertical direction. Okay. So we can, we can take a situation and we can apply it so that we can look at each component independently. And a place where this becomes very useful is any object flying through the air. Okay. So since it's football season, we can use football. The quarterback throws the football like that. Once it leaves his hand, it's got all of the motion that it's going to get, almost all of the motion it's going to get, in all of the force it's going to get in the horizontal direction. So that motion and how far it goes depends on what he does right here, okay? How much force he applies to it. There's a little bit of an issue with air resistance, but, but it's not very big. It's big enough that the winds, if the wind's blowing, they have to worry about it. On the other hand, in the vertical direction, there's always gravity. So while the ball is thrown up, it's going to come back down. We all know that. So, so what his velocity that he gives it Depend, is important right at the beginning, and it's certainly important on how far it goes, but there will be a change in the vertical motion. Okay? And we could apply this equally well to uh, a volleyball. Uh, mostly volleyballs get hit, and they're a little more tricky to deal with than, uh, than footballs. I mean, all the quarterback has to do is sit there and give it the motion. A volleyball player has to get up there in the air, figure out how to go and knock on it, and that's harder. So we'll, we'll let other people worry about that. Okay, now to see how well we're doing with this one, I'm going to do a little experiment here, but I'm going to have you predict what's going to what the result is. But this one is I can't fix the result. Okay, I'll show you what the experiment is without doing it. In the long run, what I'm going to do is push this cart 
Uh oh, it's not turned on. Just a second. There we go. Okay. Going to push this cart along the track. It's going to reach this point where there's a little thing that puts out that connects to a switch that throws the ball in the air. That throws the ball in the air. That sometimes throws the ball in the air. Okay, you can imagine the ball coming up, ball coming back down right now. Okay, and <laughs> you got that, right? <laughs> I'm gonna, while you're answering the question, I'm going to have to figure out what's going on here. Uh, the question is, when I do this, let me turn it off and show you what I'm going to do. In the long run, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have it come along like this. When it gets to this point, if it's working, the ball will go up in the air, will be shot straight up by what's in here. And the question is, where will the ball land in comparison to the cart? Will it land in front of the cart, behind the cart, inside the cart? Or is this another question where I can come up with a trick? OK, so that's your next one on the PDA. And I'll try to figure out what's going on. <laughs> I'll get Peter. Peter, can you? <laughs> My little Pasco cart doesn't seem to be working. I'm not. I turned it on. It's blinking, but oh, oh, I thought you wanted it to drop. Oh, okay, okay. Can we switch it quickly? Because I've already given them this. Oh, that's it. Okay, great. Thank you. So. I'll do the drop second. Okay, thanks. Okay, let me see how you're doing. Ah, too many. Okay, we've got about an equal, whoops, wrong one. Equal vote for in the cart and behind the cart. Only one person is interested in in front of the cart. Okay. And uh, let's give it a try and see what happens. Just a second. Get some of the extraneous stuff out of the way. I think you probably saw what's going to happen, but uh, I'll get that out for a moment. Ah, now I'm off track. Almost in the cart. <laughs> Thank you. Try that one more time. There, I did it. Now, just to show you that probably I can repeat it. OK. And let's see, how are we doing on time? Oh, we're running out of time, so we better stop on that. Uh, for next time, you can think about what would happen if I had it on the long pole and it dropped down. OK. What's happening here is the, the cart has a motion. While the ball is inside the cart, of course, it has the same motion as the cart. Now, when it gets knocked up in the air, what is the direction of the force acting on the ball? Straight up, right? So here, there's a force up, but still no horizontal force. So it's now out of the cart, but how does, it ho how does its horizontal force compare to the cart's horizontal force? I've, I didn't say that right. Horizontal motion. You've, you answered the right question, even though I asked you the wrong one. OK, horizontal, yeah, the horizontal forces are still zero on both of them, roughly zero on the cart because there's a little bit of friction. Okay. So what's the horizontal motions? They stay the same. Okay. 
So what happens is that ball just follows along underneath or over the cart and will come back down into it. Okay. Okay, okay we've got one more yet that we have to do, so hang in there. What I haven't talked about yet and what you did a little bit upstairs was objects moving in a circle. Okay, so today's object moving in a circle is a beaker with water in it. And people start putting away their computers in the front row. They know better. Okay, I think we, what you saw upstairs was the same sort of thing. The car was moving around the corner in a circle the slot car, there was a little thing on top of it, same force was not applied to it, so no force keeps going in a straight line. Now, we can do this with water by flipping the water around in a circle, and the question is why doesn't the water come out of the beaker? We know that if I just turn the beaker upside down. I will demonstrate this in the sink. The water will come out. Okay. Now we don't have quite time to answer that today, but in the application activity you're going to look at a couple of different things where liquids are going around in circles or even one where they're going in a straight line and by looking at those by the time you come to class on Friday, you ought to be able to tell me why I can do this and why I shouldn't stop this motion when the beaker's right up there. Okay, so take that up on 